G'day everybody, Nick Dingle here again with another C-sharp tutorial. This time we're looking at if statements and switch cases. Now I'm going to use a grouping term straight away and call these things decisions. Okay, if you have watched the second operator's video, good, because you're well on your way. I need everyone to understand relational and logical operators before you get into it. It's in the description of the video if you haven't seen it. So let's get straight into this. Decisions are the ability to create code which can execute and may not execute every single time. So it allows you to have questions in your code and you can question lots of things. You can question variables, you can question input from the user, you can question almost anything, okay? And that's the best bit about them. So let's just get straight into it. To do an if statement, all right, we type the word if, all lowercase, and then we open brackets and we specify what we're about to check. Now, what we're about to check is called a condition and it must boil down to one of two things, a true or a false. If it boils down to something else, you're going to get yourself an error. So let's say, for example, I'm just going to do a very simple relational operator, one less than two, which is going to boil down to true in this particular case. Now, if one's less than two, let's console right line. That's correct. Because why not? And then I'll put a read key below it because it's always good to see the screen. So if I press play, you'll see it says, that's correct. And the read keys there so I can exit. So the cool thing about this is what's actually happened is C sharp has checked my if statement. It said, okay, is one less than two true? Good. And it executes this one line of code next to it. Now, if this condition here happened to be false, is one greater than two, not quite true. Okay, then it's going to ignore this line of code here. All right, let me run it and you'll see that nothing pops up and I'm actually sitting on the read key, so I have to press enter to exit at least. All right, now I'm gonna do something that I have not shown you before and that's called a step into. Now, the shortcut for it is F11 and that's what I tend to use. And I'm gonna hit F11 and what it's gonna do is execute one line of code at a time. Okay, so I press that and this yellow bar here indicates what line of code we are just about to execute. So if I hit F11, it's gonna execute line 12 jumps down, and you can see it's about to do part of line 14, okay? And because one is not greater than two, and you can see it says false there, actually jumped over my line of code and gone straight to 16, okay? It's gonna do the read key, so I'll just press a button. There's the end of my code, and the program shuts down, okay? Now this is what you call a single line if. Single line because obviously everything is written in a single line, but riddle me this. What if you wanted to run a couple of right lines, maybe you want to change the background color depending on the value, okay? Well then you need what's called a multi-line if, obviously. So if it's a single, that's gonna be a multi, hopefully. So the way that we write a, a multi-line is pretty straightforward. You simply use curly braces like that. So all I did to get those curly braces up there was shift, give it a left curly brace, it automatically puts the right one there, and when I press the enter key, automatically unfurls on the next couple of lines. And then I can add in as many lines of code in there as I want. Uh, just forgot to put the dot. And let's change the foreground color to, mm, what's a horrible color? Yellow, sounds good. And then we can just write something to the screen. This is good stuff. All right, so this line of code is gonna be completely ignored because one greater than two is false, but one less than two is true. So this chunk here, also known as a block of code, so anything in between a left and a right curly brace is known as a block, all right? Because it chunks code together into a block. So all of this will be executed if this condition is true. Well, it is true, so you get a nice ugly, this is good stuff on the screen. All right, and I can F11 again to quickly show you. This is false, so it gets skipped. This is true, so it jumps into your block, does the three lines of code, finishes the block, and does a read key. All right, they're the basics of, yep, let's hit that button there. These are the basics of if statements, okay? Now, to make this a little bit more interesting, I wanna turn off all this code for the moment, Bloop, like so. And let's actually let the user in on this, okay? Let the user put something into the program because right now I'm using static values. And again, even though we have a decision there, 
it's going to be the same program every time we run. So if I ask the user to type a number, okay, it's going to be much more interesting because they're going to get to choose what number goes into the program. All right, so let's do an int.parse. Okay, whoop, I don't know why I put them there. We do a console read line so we can read what's on the console. And then we've got ourselves a number from the user and we can use an if statement to check the value inside of it. So if we go if, and then in brackets we go num is greater than zero. Well, I'm double typing that apparently. Well, if we've got a number greater than zero, that means we've got a positive value. So let's tell them all about it, okay? Because there's nothing more exciting. That's a positive number, okay? Simple. All right, so if I run this code, I now have the choice of setting the value of number. So that means every time I run the program, I could type in 10 and get, yay, it's a positive number. Or I could run the program again, and if I type in negative 10, I don't get anything on the screen because it's skipped over my lines 29 to 31. All right? and that's just how you can make your programs a little bit more interactive. And this is sort of where text-based games come from. It's just lots and lots of if statements, really. Okay, now it's probably about time that we Amp this up a little bit. Well, if they type in a positive number, they get a message. Let's give them a message if they put a negative number in, okay? Because it's just nice to do that, okay? And once again, we're gonna put an interesting message saying that's a negative number. Can't type. All right, so if I type in a positive number, yay. If I type in a negative number, we now get a message, okay? There is a third case. I won't touch on that just yet, but I want to touch on the efficiency of that co this code, sorry, because it's not very efficient at the moment. If I F11 this, okay, start our code, we ask the question, we're going to get an answer, hopefully. I'm going to type in minus 10 for a negative number. I don't know why I'm continually picking 10, by the way. Anyway, if you have a look here, 10 minus 10, greater than zero is false, so it gets skipped over. And this one here is true, so it jumps into the if statement block, writes that's a negative number and jumps to read key. Yay, happy days. Now, one thing I just wanna quickly note as well, whoops, press the wrong button. If I do F11 again, type in a positive number. And obviously this block of code from 29 to 31 is gonna execute because it's positive. And then we're gonna check if it's negative and then we read key. Now, what I wanna quickly point out, this chunk here, if I've got a positive number and this has executed, this chunk of code here is 100% redundant because I already know that the number is positive and I don't want to ever look at this. Now, if this is the case, if this chunk of code is going to fire off and this one's never going to have or never going to happen, what you do there is you put what's called an else if on top of that. And I like to get rid of the blank line there just to bring it together. It doesn't actually matter if you do or you don't. So what I'm doing here is if I've got a positive number, and it executes lines 29 to 31, it's actually then going to jump straight to 37 because else now has strung these ifs together. And F11 to show you how that works. I'll type in 10 for a positive number. We execute our three lines and then it jumps over all of the rest of it. So you could have as many else ifs stringing this if statement longer and longer and it would skip over all of it. But if the first one doesn't go off, if I type in a negative number, five, whoa, we're on a sidebar. That one gets skipped over, but the else if still fires off, okay? Only one if has to be true when you're using an if else if statement, okay? And there we go. So we have got that third case I mentioned before. It can be positive, it can be negative, but it can also be zero, okay? There's only one other value that num really can be. Instead of writing else if num equals zero, which I could do, I'll, in fact, I'll even write it and then just talk about it. Okay, I'm gonna start cheating here. That's it, zero. Okay, you can see I get less excited as I go down, apparently. Anyway, so as you can see, these are all the cases covered for this one. Now, this is actually a little bit redundant. I don't need to write this. I can actually drop off all of this and leave just the else. So what that means there is if the number is not positive and it's not negative, well, whatever else it is, just print that, okay? So I've now covered all my bases when it comes to my numbers. There's my it's a zero, okay?
So that's said and done. That is how you do an if statement. You do an if else statement and also an if else if else statement. All right. I want to step it up and we're going to do one last example before I close out this video. So commenting you out again, matey. And we're going to do a bit of a different one. And it's in the title of the video. It's called a switch. Now, a switch is great when you're checking the value of a single variable against single values. And we'll get to exactly what that means in a moment. But let's set up ourselves a little scenario here. Let's say we have a menu in our program. We go select from the following, like so. All right, and then we want to give them a couple of choices. Let's say they can type in um, A or apple, because that's always interesting. And then B for banana. And finally, D for, yeah, no, I'm not going to write anything rude, carrot. Okay, and then let's ask the question. So what's your selection? Bang, like so. Okay, and then let's make it a char for this one. All right, nice and simple. And I'm going to call it selection because that just matches the word. So what I'm expecting the user to type in is an A, a B, or a C. So in this case, let's use a read key to get that value. All right. But to do that, we just go console.readKey, and then in brackets, or after the brackets, sorry, I have to do dot key char. Okay, can you see the little data type there? It matches up to my variable data type, like so. And what this is going to do, display a menu, wait for one key to be pressed. When it's pressed, grab the character and then store it inside selection. And then what I want to do is basically, based on what letter they've chosen, I want to say, okay, well, they've chosen apple or banana or they've chosen carrot. I could use if statements for this one, by the way. I could go if selection equals, and then I use apostrophes for a character, if you haven't seen this before. And then I could go, yay, you chose chose an apple. Yay, whatever like that. Okay, but it's not what I'm going to do. A switch case is great for when you're working with variables like this. All right, and the way it's written is you write switch, and then in brackets, you specify the variable. So in this case, selection. Okay, I open up a block of code, and then all of my cases go below here. So when I say cases, this one here is effectively a case for my if statement. This is a second case, and this is a third case. So in the switch, what I do is I write case, and I'm basically saying, what's the first value that selection can be? Well, the first value is A. So we put a colon after it. And what I'm going to suggest straight away that you do is you type the word break. Okay, and we'll get to what that means in a second. And then I'm going to do the other two. So case B and then break. Can't spell. Case C, break. And then there's one other one. So just like we have an else in the if statement, we have an else for switch, but it's actually called default. Okay. And we'll get to what that actually means in just a moment. So break. Anyway, so what this is saying here, I'm going to put code in between the case and the break statements here. So if I type in A, so I type in A and that goes inside of selection, we check selection. And if the letter is A, then whatever code is here is the one that's going to be executed. You love apples. Good for you. Okay, like so. And then one for banana as well, because we can't leave him out. And I'm just going to leave the message as is, because this video is probably going on long enough. And then we go carrot, good for you. And then we just, for default, this is basically if they chose any other letter on the keyboard. And we just go, that's not part of the game. That makes no sense. Let's go invalid <laughs> choice. All right, I'm trying to be too silly there. Okay, so if I run my program now, I've got my menu popping up. It's asking me for just one key press. So I'm just going to press A and it says, you love apples, good for you. Now I could put a right line in there to put it down the next line. I really don't care at this point. I just wanted to show you a switch. Now, what happens though, if your user happens to type in, as you can see, a capital A, well, it comes up invalid choice. Well, that's incredibly true because a capital A is not the same as a little one. So the way we get around that is you just stack the cases. Like that. There are other ways you can do it. This is probably the simplest one. Okay. Case B. And then we can do the same thing for C. 
Okay, so this is how you would create a very, very simple menu, okay, and check what the user has chosen so you can act on it. Now the break basically indicates the, it's essentially the bottom of these cases. So for case little a and big A, this is my code and this is where it stops. And what break does is it sends you to the bottom of the block of code and we'll F11 again, just to show you how that works. I'm gonna choose banana this time around, so capital B. And then we go switch, so you can see selection is capital B. Jump straight to that case, executes it, and when we hit break, it's jumping to the bottom. Okay, so break just says, get me out of this block of code. And you can do that actually anywhere you wanted to, okay? You can put breaks in blocks of code anywhere and it jumps to the bottom, or jumps out of it actually. All right, we'll do my read key just to finish my program, and we're done. Okay, just to quickly emphasize this last one here, Default is the exact same thing as else. So basically, if it's not A and not any of the A's, not any of the B's, not any of the C's, then we just default to this bottom choice here. And that's essentially what that means there. All right, that's if statements and switch cases, guys. I hope you're gonna make more, much more interesting programs now on when you've got this in your little tool belt. But thank you very much for watching, everybody. I've got like, subscribe, and comment down the bottom. I'd love to hear from every single one of you. But I'm gonna see you in the next video. We're actually gonna talk about loops and make things a little bit more interesting for ourselves. See you then.